you may be seated. Let's receive our offering before we get into the message. <laughs> Amen. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 in the Amplified Bible, Hebrew, Hebrews 13 and 5. If you need an offering envelope, raise your hands. I'm taking the time to do this because uh, we're, we're, we're moving into some crazy days and you need to know how to take authority over this world, amen? Uh, <clears throat> Hebrews 13, 5 in the Amplified, he says, let your character and your moral disposition be free from the love of money. What does that mean? Well, uh, 1 Timothy 6 and 10 talks about the love of money. Now, the love of money, uh, if you have a Bible, 1 Timothy 6 and, and 10 in the King James, um, the love of money is not having money. The love of money is trusting money more than you trust God. That's what the love of money is. A lot of people, because of whatever issues they have, they think if you have money, then you have a love of money. No, he says, for the love of money in uh, 1 Timothy 16, 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, what's the root of all evil? The root of all evil is that you're trusting another source more than you're trusting God. You're trusting in money more than you, to meet your needs, more than you trust God to meet your needs. And one of the things we've said is that Many people have a difficult time giving it because they don't believe that God will take care of them. Well, go back to Hebrews 13 and, and verse 5 in the Amplified. Here is God's commitment to take care of you. Make sure that you don't have character that will trust money or mammon more than you trust God. He says, let your character or, or moral disposition be free from the love of money, including greed and avarice and lust and cravings for earthly possessions. And be satisfied with your present circumstances as with, and, and with what you have. For he, God himself, has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down, nor relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. That's his commitment to take care of you. Amen. Now, here's what you and I walk in, Philippians 4, 19. Here's what we, we keep with us. He says, for my God will liberally supply, feel to the full your every need according to his riches and glory. Say this out loud, God takes care of me. As we continue to dive and to learn about generous giving, we come to the place of understanding that God does not want something from you financially to meet a requirement. He wants what's in your heart. He wants you to start doing things from him based on what's in your heart. He wants you to pray because you want to pray. He wants you to worship him because you want to worship him. And he wants you to give because you're, you're wanting to give out of a cheerful heart, not out of a threat of hell, not out of a threat of curse. <laughs> Honey, Jesus took care of the curse once and for all. And once Jesus is taking care of a curse, you can't be cursed no more because Jesus is taking care of it. For you to be cursed would mean he would be a failure because he didn't do a good job of taking care of the curse. And I'm telling you, when you give out of your heart as the Spirit of God leads and directs your life, you're going to find the cheerfulness of giving and the generosity of giving, how it does something for your life that a whole lot of things cannot do. Amen. I also want to show you, I wanted to mention this to you. Last week we talked about how, how our giving is serving, feeding families. Well, we discovered that over, we're giving over 200 and over 200,000 pounds of food. Show this footage, guys. Over 200,000 pounds of food that we're giving out to people. Um, we regularly give uh, and feed people every third Wednesday on each month, and we provide food to our local school districts, including Creekside School, Banneker School, Fulton County uh, School Community Fair, Benjamin Hayes 
high, high school, North Fayette uh, Elementary School. We provide food to shelters, organizations such as Trinity Men's Shelters, Mercy Care, and uh, as well as during our prestige outreach every single month. I uh, am going to try to do this at least every Sunday, uh, seeing is believing, amen? And I want you to understand that the volunteers that have been doing this, oh, Ken, ever since uh, the pandemic, right? And that we have been, we have taken on the responsibility of making sure that families don't go hungry, kids don't show up at school hungry, even when the governor or the government in Georgia cancels the feeding programs in area, your church and your support make sure that we can continue the thing on. And we are so blessed with that. We're happy about that. And so we're grateful. Uh, the goal is, you know, we're, we're going to be reaching a million tons uh, soon, and we're, we're going to keep going and keep going because we believe that God has anointed us to do something like this. But there are other areas of this ministry where things are going on, and we're going to do a better job of telling the story of World Changes Ministry and how your support is making lives better and we're able to care for people. Amen? So give yourselves a big hand. Everything that you see right now is being done because of the generosity that you have. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give, this opportunity to sow, this opportunity to not give out of obligations or to give to, uh, you know, to meet the requirement. We are giving out of a heart that's in love with you. And Father, I thank you that the, your word of blessing will come to pass in our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. Let's just go ahead and receive the offering this morning. And as you receive the offering, um, <clears throat> we're going to start some good trouble this day. Good trouble, good trouble. <sighs> Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you, it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. We're going to read this in the King James, first of all. Romans 3 verse 22 in the King James. And we're going to talk about the finished life of faith. The finished life of faith. In other words, what does life look like through the lens of the finish? What does it look like living a life of faith through the lens of the finish? Now, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 22, he says, even the righteousness of God which is by faith and of Jesus Christ, and it is unto all, and is a, it is upon all them that believe. Underline that phrase, all them that believe. He says, for there is no difference. All them that believe. Now, notice the subject is, you know, the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. It's by the faith of Jesus Christ to all them that believe. Now, uh, I want to read this out of the mirror translation. And um, I've tried to convince you of certain things looking at the Greek language, but we're now going to look through the lens of Jesus. The mirror study Bible says, Jesus is what God believes about you. In him, the righteousness of God, in him, the righteousness of God is on display in such a way that everyone may be equally persuaded about what God believes about them, that everyone can be persuaded about what God believes about them. Regardless of who they are, there is no distinction. Now, follow me very carefully at the first part of this teaching this morning. Our justification us being declared righteous, our justification 
in the, in the eyes of most Christians, it is viewed from a conditional perspective rather than a finished perspective. In other words, our justification is viewed based on what I can do to, to, make, this, to make this happen or to get this to happen in my life. What do I have to do to be made righteous? And you see that little phrase, to all them that believe. I'll, that gives the indication that, well, you've got to believe to be made righteous. Now, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge your mindset, I'm getting ready to just go. I've eased into this thing, and I'm getting ready to really go for it. But we've been trained that we've got to believe it. That's our work. We're seeing it as our work in order for it to be. So we're emphasizing what man must do to bring about their salvation rather than what God has already done rather than what is finished. So we don't, we don't emphasize what God has already done. Uh, religion doesn't teach us to, to emphasize what is already finished. Religion teaches us, well, it's conditional. You got to believe, and then you got to do this, and then you got to do that, and then it'll be done. And I am, I'm, I'm trying to get you to see it is finished, and you're trying to say, no, no, but you got you to believe and you got to do that and you got to confess it and you got to do that. Well, that's no longer unconditional. It's no longer a gift because the conditions are that you do all the things that we've been, we've been taught to do. So we got to understand that Christ, his, his faith, his one faith, you know, one Lord, one faith, there's just one faith, okay? He saw the end from the beginning. And so Christ's faith was, was his overwhelming yes to the Father's faith. Basically, it's one faith, it's the Father's faith, and then the Father's faith was embodied in the body of Jesus. <laughs> and then our faith is a reflection of Jesus' faith, which is a reflection of God's faith. He's not, he's not giving everybody some different faith. He's dealt to every man the measure, one measure, the only measure, the only true faith. It's not you got to measure, you got to measure, you got to measure, you all got to measure. No, you all have the faith of God. You all have the faith of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Glory to God. So he, it was an overwhelming yes to the Father's faith. God's faith, the one faith, the faith of Christ saw us in Christ. God saw us in Christ. And in Paul's understanding, it is the faith of Christ. It is the faith that is in Christ. It's the faith of God that he embodies, that Jesus embodies. It is that faith that justifies us. It is Christ's faithful yes to the Father's belief in us that justified all men. See, we spend so much time talking about what you believe about the Father, we spend no time talking about what the Father believes about you. If everybody's on the bus, say amen. amen. And it is that faith that is our faith. I, I, I need to make sure you get this. When I now refer to my faith, I'm referring to Jesus' faith. I'm referring to God's faith. It's that faith that is my faith. Bosha. It's God's faith that is Jesus' faith. Faith, and I'm in Jesus, and now my faith is Jesus' faith, which is God's faith, but I don't have a faith outside of the only true faith. Yeah. I know, I know. You, you, you see how it is to break up the fallow ground of a religious mindset? But, but I thought we have... See, let me show, let me show you. If it's your faith, you know what you're going to be struggling with all the time? You're going, to struggle, you're going to be struggling with how inadequate your faith is, how little your faith is. Do I have enough of the faith? Oh, it didn't work. Maybe it was because of my faith. And, 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 and you'll keep looking at your faith like it's just not enough. But, but I'm trying to get you to see your faith as his faith, as God's faith, and God's faith 
is the faith. It is strong. It is powerful. It is complete. It is done. When, you, when he gave you his faith, it's not your personal faith aside from Jesus' faith, aside from God's faith. Honey, you got faith. You got faith to move a mountain because God created the mountain with his faith, and you possess that faith. It is that faith that is our faith. And you know what about the faith that we have that is Jesus' faith? Because we live by the faith of the Son of God. So we're not ever talking about your faith. We live by the faith of the Son of God. I, I, I ain't even got started yet. I'm a, I got an itch in my feet. I'm ready to dance. I'm ready to tear something up because... I, you, when you get this, nothing will be withheld from you because what you, what you think is being withheld is already done. And I'm just trying to get you to realize and submit to it. You, a perfect illustration, the other day I was on my phone looking for my phone. <laughs> ever, ever happened to you? I was on my phone asking, it, I, I, heard, I heard it come out of my mouth. I'm on my phone saying, oh, Lord, where my phone? <laughs> and I had to realize I already got my phone. Y'all don't hear me. You saying, Lord, where is my righteousness? You got to realize you got your righteousness. Where is my healing? You got to realize you got your healing. Lord, where's my power? You got to realize you got your power. It's not about getting it. You got it. And don't ever say an issue in your life is because something must be wrong with your faith. Because that ain't yours, that's his. And his faith is perfect, and his faith is finished, and his faith is completed. And you live by the faith of, of, of the Son of God. Hallelujah. You live by the faith of God Almighty, oh, glory, of Jesus Christ. Now, I know I'm dismantling the whole faith structure. But not really, because when you get down to it, the bottom line of faith is you've got to stand on what Jesus has already done. So, this subject of faith, it's a huge, big argument amongst theologians, especially Romans 3.22, because in Romans 3.22, you know, if you want to get just how theologians look at it, then they look at the genitive subject, which will come out to be the faith of Christ, or they look at the genitive object, which will turn out to be the faith in Christ. And I'm sure Paul didn't mean for us to be having some argument about something that small. So, I want to take it another, another perspective, another direction. I want to see if I can attack it, attack it from another place. Hebrews chapter 1 um, verses 2 through 3, I'm going to read it out of the Mirror Bible. What is your sudden obsession with the Mirror Bible? Oh, it comes just straight from the Greek and allows the update of where we live at now along with that Greek. I just love it. Now, to interpret it correctly, we need to look beyond the grammar, which we've been on for a while, and we need to look through the lens of Christ. We need to look through the lens of the finished. And so Hebrews 1 and 2 tells us that God's final word to us is spoken in his son, Jesus Christ. Look at this, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. He says, in, in a son, in a son, God declares the incarnate word to be the heir of of all things. He is, after all, the author of the ages, the incarnate word. So now we're talking about that faith and word wrapped up in, in flesh. The Messiah message, the Messiah message. 
is what has been on the tip of the Father's tongue all along. Now, he is the crescendo of God's conversation with us and gives context and content to the authentic prophetic thought. Everything that God has in mind for mankind is voiced in Jesus. The incarnate Christ, the Messiah, Jesus, is God's language. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Jesus is God's language. <laughs> oh, boy. He is the radiant and flawless mirror expression of the person of God. Jesus is the mirror expression of the person of God. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And also, when you hear me, you have heard the Father. And when you live through my faith, you've lived through the faith of the Father. He makes the glorious intent of God visible and exhibits the character and every attribute of Elohim, Elohim in human form. That's so powerful. Every attribute of God is, a, is, 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 is in the attributes the attributes of Elohim are seen in Jesus Christ. Having accomplished the cleansing of our sins, he sat down, enthroned in the boundless measure of his majesty in the right hand of God. He is the force of the universe upholding everything that exists by the word of his power. It is about Jesus. Men have tried to talk him away. Men had tried to have problems because they saw this, this uh, long-haired, softest cotton Jesus with rosy cheeks that Michelangelo painted. Uh-uh. That ain't the one. He ain't the one. <laughs> Jesus didn't have a curling iron out every, every, every morning before he... I want, I want to look at verse 3. Again, Jesus is the crescendo of God's conversation. He's the whole point and reason. He gives context and content to the authentic thought. Everything that God had in mind for mankind is voiced in Jesus. Now, let's break, break that down. Jesus is God's language. That's just heavy all by itself. Jesus is God's language. His final words were, watch this, watch, 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 watch his final words. It is finished. It is finished. And I don't know what we were thinking about. We, we know it said it is finished. We say it every, every Easter. It is finished. We had little children plays. It is finished. Well, what you think he was talking about? And so that has to be the lens through which we read Scripture. Therefore, now, when you come back to Romans chapter 3, verse 22, go back to Romans 3, 22, you see the faith of Christ or you see faith in Christ. You have to choose. If you see the faith in Christ, then you see yourself in a conditional place where you got to do something in order to receive a gift. Well, if you had to do something to receive a gift, that's not a gift anymore. If it's the faith of God, then it is something that came through him. He now is the origin, and he now is the source of that thing, not you. And he is the source of our righteousness, not you. He's the source of our salvation, not you. He's the source of our redemption, the source of our holiness, the source of it, not you. All of it is nothing but gifts that came from him. And because of that choice, because of that choice, it speaks the language. The language that is spoken is the language of it is finished. That's the language that's spoken. And so now we all have got to come to the place where we 
renew our mind in the realm of the finished instead of our mind being in this conditional place where you're always having to struggle to do something. Now, a couple of things I'll admit over the last few weeks. We, we definitely have the tools to be able to look up these verses in Greek, and I believe that's essential. I, I think it's very important. But we've, we've trusted in the translators, and we've trusted in the theologians, and we've trusted in the biblical commentaries. We've trusted in the, their, their, their interpretation for a long time. And it was difficult to preach something like this to a congregation of people because religion has trained us to come to church to hear what you already know, and I got to make sure you're having a good time or you won't come back. I'm over that. That's why I had to get delivered from <laughs> approval addiction because you're not going to change the way you think if I'm just concerned about if you're having a good time. It's time to learn something for the times to come. And while everybody else is struggling to try to get what God has already given them, you'll be walking in the realm of the finish. They'll be looking at, like, like, at, like, looking at you like something going on. You're on your way to the doctor in an ambulance, and you're saying, my healing is a finished thing. And they'll say, what do you mean it's a finished thing? The doctor ain't seen you yet. He ain't got to see me. Jesus finished this 2,000 years ago. I am, <coughs> I am telling you, you're going to see an increase of the glory of God because you're finally abiding in the right realm. You're, you're finally abiding in the place where Jesus is, in the place where God is. We over here trying. Can you imagine how frustrating it is? You done worked all day to get dinner on the table, and dinner's on the table, and somebody come in there talking about, won't you cook dinner? It almost makes you mad. I, I, I cook dinner. Won't you go in there and see? Won't you go in there and realize that dinner's on the table? Won't you go in there and submit yourself and sit down and eat dinner? Well, that's what God is saying. Y'all keep coming to me in, in loud prayer. Oh, God, do this. Oh, God, do this. Done. Oh, God, if you can do this, if you can stop by just a little while, then everything going to be all right. Done. I, I am in you. I live in you. I move in you. You keep asking me to do what is already finished. Trusting men who didn't have an understanding of finished. <laughs> and so we read these verses thinking, if I can just have enough faith, or if I can just believe enough, not realizing and resting in the truth that there is only one faith and that, and, and that is his faith in us, and we are simply reflections of the one faith, the one faith of God, the one faith of Christ. And so by translating these verses, faith in Christ, the translators allowed for only one interpretation, putting our faith in Christ. They forced upon us their own interpretational decision of what the verse means, and it began <coughs> to rule out the passages reading as saying that it is the, it is the faith of Christ. It, it, it's Christ's faith and not our own. And these faulty interpretations have been passed down for centuries, resulting in the believer who believe the finished works of Christ is conditional upon putting our faith in Christ. And so we think, well, I believe in the finished works, but it's conditional yeah, but you got to believe it. And I thought it was this, yes. Yeah, you got to believe it. No, I got to believe that it's his faith. <laughs> I got to believe it's his faith. I got to believe that it is finished. I got to believe that it's done. That's what I got to believe. I don't believe in a conditional manner where believing becomes the condition by which I get something that's finished. That doesn't even go together. If it's finished, why am I having to do this to finish it? Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? <laughs> That's just wake some of y'all up because y'all like, what? <laughs> some of y'all like, why are we talking about this? Because I'm trying to get you to move from, this is what religion teaches you. Religion keeps teaching you, come to church so we can show you all the stuff you got to do. And if you do these things, 
then God will be God in your life. And God's like, no. We tried that in the Old Covenant. We tried it in the Old Covenant. I, we even tried to, to put the fear of death there. And if you don't do it, you're going to die. If you do these things, you'll be blessed. If you do these things, you'll be cursed. We tried all of that. It didn't change nothing. It just made it worse. And now you as church folks, y'all do the same thing. You look at people in all kinds of situations, and you sit there and take them apart. They're going to hell. <clears throat> they're going to hell. That ain't God. They're going to hell. And they're going to hell. And today I decided, let's talk about this heaven and hell stuff. Because you keep, you, you're focusing in on the heaven and hell piece, and you, you're still not focusing in on finished. And when, once you get this, you're going to realize how, how awesome Jesus is. It's done. Jesus came to finish all the stuff that mankind couldn't finish. And then he said, y'all ain't got to do nothing. All I want y'all to do is realize that it's finished. That's, so whatever prayer you plan on praying today, most of it's done. So that's going to change a lot of our prayer time. You spend your time praying about everything that's finished. Lord, heal me, help me, guide me. Finished, done, completed. And he's trying to find somebody on the planet that will just line up with him and start living your life in the finish. Wake up in the morning. You got a challenging day. You say to yourself, my victory is a finished work. Hallelujah. And you start praising God, and they can't figure you out. Why are you praising God? Because I know what's been done. Oh, my goodness. Let me keep moving so we can be finished. But what, what if we would have gotten the right translation? What if we would have translated it right as the faith of God? How might this have changed the entire Western theology? What I'm talking to you about is the entire Western theology. Ain't nobody going to invite me to their church to preach because they think something happened to me. Because I won't keep preaching what everybody else preaching. Because I won't, I won't keep telling you, only say amen. Listen, folks. <laughs> Some people only want to hear what they already know. Where's growth there? Where's maturity there? Don't you know that every generation ought to be able to take us up another step? And we've been sitting there, sitting on the same thing. Well, it's been working for me for the last 60 years. I ain't going to change now. Well, you, you need to go and get out of the way because we hadn't heard the fullness of the whole thing. And I'm telling you right now, God wants us to learn to finish. So what would have happened? Would we have thought that salvation, justification, redemption was conditional? Or would we have understood that all was finished for all times, requiring, requiring, requiring nothing on our part? All right, so let's, let's look at this. Ephesians chapter 2 and 8, because I'm going to say some really radical things. And, and I, I thank God every day. I know why I had to be delivered from uh, validation of people. I know why I had to be delivered from approval addiction. I know why I had to be delivered from people who come to church and who don't come to church. And I know I had to be delivered from who left. Oh, I don't agree with him. I know I had to be delivered. You have to be delivered to serve God. You have to be delivered to serve God. I'm telling you, in another 10 years, everybody's going to be preaching this because I got a gigantic microphone and I plan on taking this thing all around the world until somebody can hear it and just learn how to read. All right, Ephesians 2 and 8. Now, for Paul, our faith is not con a condition of our justification or our salvation. Paul knew that. Paul knew that our faith, this individualized faith away from God and Jesus, is not, the, is not a condition for justification or faith. Ephesians chapter 2 and 8, watch this. This is interesting. Watch this. Verse 8 in the King James, he says this. For by grace are you what? And you got it through what? And this is not of yourselves. 
It's not of yourselves. All right, let me see. All right, it, 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 what'd you have to do with grace? What'd you have to do with salvation? What'd you have to do with faith? Uh, but see, here's what they taught you. For by grace are you saved or, you know, delivered or sound and uh, soteria, but you got it through your faith. He didn't say that. He said it came through faith that was not of your own. Faith was not of your own. Salvation was not of your own. And grace was not of your own. It was all grace. It was all God. But somehow, seriously, I want you to just think about the mighty, wise, loving God. I want you to think about something. So this guy gets to heaven, and some, somebody in the back said, he never did go to the prayer room to pray the prayer of salvation. But when he was listening to the Word, he had a moment in his heart where he said, yes, God. And he decided, you know, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't do good around people, so I, 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 I receive you right now, Lord. And he never did go to the room. So tell me this, tell me this now, tell me. Is God going to tell him to depart from him because he didn't say the prayer? Because he had Christ in his heart, which is where he belonged. See, religious people put all of these rules on you about what you got to do to get what God got. And God's just trying to get you to do it out your heart because he weighs your heart. Because if you can get it in your heart, it'll flow into your life. If you can get it in your heart, fruit comes out the branch. You are the branch. He's the root. Get it in your heart and something will get on the branch. But all these religious people ready to judge and condemn other people's fruit when they don't even realize because a heart change is going on, the fruit is changing. And then we have this idea that the day you get saved, you're perfect. Some of y'all been saved 30 years. I ain't reached that yet. What you talking about? The day you get saved, oh, you got caught doing that. If you got caught, you were doing it. The reason why they had to hide to get caught because you so judgmental. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. Sweet lips, sweet lips, sweet lips. You so judgmental. You take people apart while you continue to ignore, ignore your own life like you ain't got nothing that need to be dealt with in your own life. Well, I don't cheat, I don't smoke, I don't spit around, but you cuss and you got a bad attitude and you cheat on your taxes and all sin has the same manner. <laughs> the Mirror Bible says this, this is awesome. In Ephesians chapter 2 and 8, he says, it was a grace thing from start to finish. Even the gift to believe simply reflects his faith. Man. Grace reveals who we are, and the faith of God persuades us of it. Oh, yes. Grace reveals who we are. And the faith of God's trying to persuade you of it. Grace is saying you're righteous. Faith is saying, come on, man, believe it. Believe it, you really are. Go ahead and accept this. Go ahead and realize this. But religion says, no, 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 no. Grace reveals who you are, and you have got to have faith and believe and pray and don't miss church. You got to do all of that. See, we're so focused on the scripture that says, uh, what's that thing where they try to condemn people about not coming to church? Because sometimes they're just tired. Uh, what now? Yeah, forsake not the assembling of yourself, as some do. You know what the Greek is talking about there? Make sure you keep community. 
And so we're so worried about coming to church that we don't even know, we don't, we, we don't have no community outside church. Where's the community outside of church? Where's the community at when somebody goes to the hospital, there's a community that can get together and pray for them? Where's the community at when somebody needs something, the community gets together? It ain't just picking the phone up and call Pastor Ken. Where's the community? Where's the community? Forsake not community. Don't turn into a hermit. Forsake not community. Now, that don't mean that. That means come to church. My Bible says, just like that lady who called her office, she said, y'all need to leave that Greek alone. Now, that ain't y'all. <laughs> y'all leave that Greek alone. <laughs> and that's the problem we're dealing with so much ignorance. Ignorance that's turned into religion. And then becomes a church thing. And then we let unlearned, ignorant preachers continue to get in the pulpit and push the same ignorance, and it just goes and goes. And they're just saying what somebody else says to because they're too scared to step out on something. Okay, all right, so I'm not, maybe, maybe I'm not 100% right with anything, but at least I got enough boldness to say, Lord, take me, and, and, and not afraid to think. Some, some Christians are afraid to think, 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 think. If some, if some guy comes to you and says, well, I'm a Christian, and he says, meet me, meet me, meet me at the hotel, that, Nick, that joker ain't no Christian. He ain't no Christian. He ain't no Christian. I was going to say Negro, but he, he ain't no Christian. I mean, come on. I mean, you got to think. Well, I don't know. You know, he prophesied to me, but, you know, he say, he say. Forget all of that. You, you don't go to no hotel with some dude you don't know. Because you keep devaluing yourself and you think this is the only man I'm going to have a chance to get. And I'm going to do whatever I need. And you got to dumb yourself down to get some dude that once he gets your cookies, he don't want to have nothing to do with you no more. And now you hurt and brokenhearted and talking about where's God? And then at night, all that, all that turned into church hurt. Where the church? Ah, 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 ah. God Almighty gave you a brain. Use it! We're going to take our time today. The Falcons ain't playing until tomorrow. I don't want to see nobody else. So we, we, you're going to get this today. You got to get this today. You got to get it today. You got to walk out of here in the finish. You got to wake up tomorrow in the finish. You got to start looking for a job in the finish. You got you to get your healing in the finish. You got to get your finances right in the finish. You got to meet God in the finish. Complete it. Done. Grace reveals it. Faith trying to persuade you. Grace completely successfully, 100% saved us. Putting our faith in Jesus didn't result. Putting our faith in Jesus didn't result. Putting our faith in Jesus didn't result in our salvation. That's strong, ain't it? We had zero contribution to our salvation. Both grace and faith are his gifts in us. And in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17, where it talks about from faith to faith. Read that, uh, uh, Romans 1, 17. He said, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed, it's revealed from faith, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live, watch this, by faith, by the faith of Jesus Christ, and then later on you're going to see at the end of this that the just live from the faith of Jesus Christ that's in them, from the faith that God has given them, from the faith, by faith. Romans 1, 17, it talks about faith to faith. The subject of the sentence is not the believer or the believer's faith. What's the subject of the sentence? Righteousness. 
righteousness of God, how it is revealed through the gospel. It is God's righteousness revealed from the faith of Jesus unto the believer's faith. It's, it's revealed from the faith of Jesus unto the believer's faith, which is the same faith. Faith, faith to faith, like a reflection, you understand? You look at yourself in the mirror, image to image, from faith to faith. God's righteousness is revealed in the origin of his faith. So you have to understand that God's faith is the source of our righteousness. His faith is the origin of our righteousness. <laughs> Not your faith or how you believe in or any condition that you'll try to meet to try to deserve righteousness, but his faith originated from his righteousness. And we have to realize, when you, you know when you realize something, you, you come to a place where you are aware of it as fact. I am aware as fact that this is done and it is finished and faith is trying to convince you of that fact. So if we miss that part of the origin of faith, we'll always strive to have, uh, we'll, we'll work hard to try to have enough faith on our own work real hard to do that. We don't have to believe in our own faith for anything. We simply need to realize that it is his faith in us. The power to walk in healing, the power to walk in prosperity and deliverance, the power to walk in wholeness is by resting in his faith in us, as us, through us, Faith to faith is his faith lived out as our faith. Faith to faith is his faith lived out as our faith. And if we believe for those things in our faith, we end up striving. We strive then. If we don't do it this way, we strive to overcome the doubts in our thinking by finding scriptures to stand on and confessing those scriptures repeatedly and then louder and then longer trying to figure out why we aren't getting what we are believing for. Whether it be healing, why are we not getting healing? Why are we not getting the financial miracle? Why are, are certain family members not saved yet? Why, why, why? I'm striving to do that because I will not receive or realize these things as being finished. Since I'm there, may I, may I get extremely radical just, just for a moment? I won't stay there long, just for a moment. His faith is eternal. His faith is always now. His faith says now you are whole. Now you are healed. Now you are prosperous. Now your family is saved. Now is not a time-bound word. Now is not a word that is bound by time. <laughs> Some people would say, well, you know, as if, as, if, as if they think that Jesus would say, okay, now, you can have it because you were faithful in obeying. Okay, now. Okay, now, now, now you can have it because you were faithful in tithing. You were faithful in, in, in waiting. You were faithful in applying your faith to these things. No! His faith says, now, as in, you, you have always been whole. Your family has always been saved. You have always been healed. Now, now was fleshed out in the time on the cross done 2,000 years ago. Now was the lamb who was slain before time began. Now is eternal. It is never bound by time's limitation. And the language of his faith speaks now. It speaks finished. Now, I know there's some people get in there. What, what you trying to say? My family always been saved. You, you, you see what I'm saying? You, you, everybody know I'm, I'm talking about God's stance. 
But if they're ever going to get to where you want them to be, you got to operate in the now. And every time they do something wrong, you fall on your face again. Lord, I don't know why you ain't. We ain't going to save them, Jesus. He said, I already have. No, nah, you ain't. <laughs> no, nah, you ain't. How you going to work with that? How you going to work with a bunch of unbelieving folks who just are so carnal, it, they can't relate with him, and he's having, he's like, how can I get this in your head? Abide in the realm of the finished. Look at what's not finished and call that thing as though it was finished. Not to get it finished, but because of your relationship with God, as far as you're concerned, it's finished, and watch the peace come. And I realize it. And so you look at your crazy uncle, and you say, man, you don't even, you, you don't even know it. And this is so true. You don't even know it, but you saved already, man. You're looking at you, what you talking about? You, you, you don't know, you don't be putting that, that save stuff on me, crippling over there, talking about all that. You, <laughs> say, oh, you don't even realize, you saved already. You know how frustrated people get when they're in pain? And, and, and you do all the things you know to do in the natural, but in, in pain, while you're getting, getting them a Tylenol and water, you give it to them, you say, you know, you already healed. Or a financial situation comes up and, 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 and you're faced with not enough and, and, and you're living in this place, well, you know, I'm already cared for and prosperous and God will take care of me. See, here's what I want, here's what I don't want to happen. I don't want you to die still struggling to try to get what's already done. I want you to walk in this realm so you can experience the glory of the finished. Having done all to do to stand, what are we talking about standing on? We're talking about standing on what's finished. Oh, that's real faith. I'm not going to be moved. I'm not going to be moved. And some of our, our folks from time past, they didn't have much knowledge, but they knew, I'm just going to stick with God. I'm just going to stay. Every, and you know how they would say that? Everything going to be all right. Yeah. Honey, everything going to be all right. You just go get you some corn bread, and I got a pot of greens in there. And they didn't ask where the fork, baby. You don't need no fork. <laughs> you pinch that cornbread, put that little pinky up. Show a little manners. Put that little pinky up. Dip that cornbread in that collard greens. Eat over your plate now, baby. There you go. <laughs> Why? Because it's it's finished. And the challenge of this Christian life is to stay there. You know what happens? When what's finished manifests, and when what's finished, glory to God, shows up in this round. See, it's finished in the finished round. You got to get it in the finished round. It's going to show up, and, and when it happens, you ain't going to have no more problem with this no more. Your whole life is going to be, it's done, it's finished, we're good. The glory is going to increase in your life. I said, the glory is going to increase in your life. I said, the glory is about to increase in your life. Glorious manifestations. Why? Because you refuse to be moved. Amen. Wow. You know, we, really, we read these letters from Paul in the New Testament. Sometimes we forget that Paul is not talking to us. He's talking to a generation who's on the other side of the cross. And there are still sacrifices, if, if you didn't know this, that people are still making sacrifices and offering them in the temple. And the law of Moses is still being upheld. And for them, their faith and the faith of their ancestors have been in Moses' law, believing that they would be made righteous by obeying it. And Paul is telling them, that they have been made righteous by Jesus' faith alone. He's telling them to simply believe that, not as in believing so that they can attain it, but believe that, that it's done. Paul doesn't talk in the Old Testament conditional language of if you do this, 
then you'll get that. He's telling them to believe it by just resting in the finished works of Jesus, that Christ finished the works and he made them righteous. And now he's trying to get them to believe by resting. To believe by resting. Now, here's the big question that's in everybody's mind. But what about Romans 10 and 9? Doesn't it say that if we believe with our hearts and confess with our mouths that then we will be saved? Okay, y'all ready? You ready? Now, now, some folks scared. They're like, man, let me get out of here. I don't know what he's talking about now. Okay, Romans 10 and 1. This will be my, my, my last area here. Romans 10 and 1 in the King James, and then let's look at it in the mirror translation. I wish you could turn the mic off just for a minute so I can blow my nose so it won't go all over the universe. Like, <laughs> so I'm going to just keep doing this. So, yeah. That dog, when I finish, I'm going to blow the trumpet in Zion. <laughs> Won't you just stay serious? You're always talking just, just funny stuff. That, that, that. Come on, man. You're going to get to the point where you're going to look at certain things the devil do at you and you're going to just laugh at it. Now, you funny. All right, Romans 10 and 1. Let's look at context. Context is king. If you take the text out of the context, you're left with the con. So let's look at context of something that we all operated in. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So here's Paul saying, one of my greatest desires is that you, my brethren, Israel, my greatest desire is for you to be saved. And then look at it in the mirror, verse 1. <clears throat> God knows how my heart aches with deep and prayerful longings for Israel to realize their salvation. All right, let's go through this now. So in Romans 10, it begins with Paul praying for Israel to be saved. Now, he's not longing for them to become saved, but he's wanting them to realize their salvation. Now, in our Western understanding, the concept of salvation has been reduced to making heaven and missing hell. Right? But that definition isn't included in either the Greek word sozo or the Hebrew word yeshua. The Hebrew word signifies freedom from, when it says salvation, <clears throat> it, it signifies freedom from that which binds or restricts you. Freedom from that which binds or restricts you. And when the children of Israel were fleeing from the Egyptians and they were crossing the Red Sea, you remember what Moses told them? I think it's in Exodus chapter 14 and 13. He said, be still and see the salvation of the Lord. He's not telling them that they would go to heaven and miss hell. He didn't say, be still, and you're going you're gonna, uh, you, to go to heaven and you're going to miss hell. Be still. No, he was telling them that they were going to be delivered and set free from the Egyptians, that they were going to be free from what was binding them and what was restricting them. And the Greek word sozo is talking about wholeness. So he says, be still. And you're going to be set free from that which binds and restricts you, and you're going to come into wholeness where there'll be nothing missing or nothing broken. Wow. So Paul's heart was burning for his, his brothers to realize their salvation, to realize their freedom from what was binding them. And guess what was binding them? The law. And he wanted them to be free so they can experience the life of God and experience the wholeness that he had already given them with nothing missing and nothing broken. For them to realize and to submit to what was finished. Now, verse 3, King James, 
He goes on in verse 3 and he says this about his brethren. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. So they, they were ignorant of God's righteousness. What did they do? They went about to establish their own righteousness, and that's been a part of the Western church theology up until now. I'm ignorant about God's righteousness being finished, and I'm going about to establish my, their own righteousness, and they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Wow. And yet they begin to seek their own righteousness. They haven't submitted to God's righteousness. Listen to this. They were already made completely righteous because of Jesus. Jesus has come. He did what he did. Paul's trying to tell him, dude, it's finished now. It's finished now. It's finished. There was no need to continue to seek to become righteous. The verse 3 in the mirror translation, Romans 10 and verse 3 in the mirror translation says this, they are tirelessly busy with their own efforts to justify themselves while blatantly ignoring the fact that God already justified them in Christ. Is that going to be us? Things that he's already done, and we are going to blatantly ignore the fact that God has already justified us. We're just going to ignore it because that ain't what my favorite Bible teacher said. So we're just going to ignore it. And we're going to seek out, and we're going to go sweat, and we're going, to, we're going to establish our own righteousness without realizing that Christ was the conclusion of the law. Follow me carefully now. And, and, and that, what I just said, Christ is the conclusion of the law, that's the context of, that's behind Romans 10, verse 9. He's talking to his Jewish brethren. That's the context. He tells them that Moses is the law's voice, but faith has a different voice. Look at Romans 10 and 5 in the King James and in the Mirror Translation. Romans 10 and 5 in the King James and the Mirror Translation. You there? Excuse me. Appreciate them cutting the mic off, praise the Lord. I can breathe. <laughs> okay, verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. That's coming out of the mouth of Moses, that you need to live by and do these things. Look at the mirror. Moses is the voice of the law. He says that a person's life is only justified in doing what the law requires. That's Moses. Moses is the voice of the law. And most churches have been listening to the voice of the law. They've been listening to Moses. They've been listening to the, to, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the law-based mentality that says you got to do good in order to get good. Wow. But in verse 6 and 7, look at this, verse 6 and 7. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh not on this wise. So the righteousness of faith is not speaking what Mo Moses is speaking. <laughs> Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Christ has already come down. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. He already rose. He tells them that faith, righteousness, the righteousness that came through Christ's faith doesn't say who will ascend into heaven or who would descend in the, into the original word was abyss or hell. Right here we see that salvation is not a heaven or hell issue. Ascending to hell or descending into, ascending into heaven or descending into hell is not the language of faith. So what does faith say? You already know this. He tells us in verse 8, look at verse 8. What does faith say? 
The word is not thee, even in thy mouth, in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. No, I went along with all that, never questioned it, da 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 So we got to keep breaking it down. Hang in here, folks. I'm all, we're almost there. Hang in there. Hang in here, folks. We're almost there. We're almost there. If you get up and leave now, you ought to slap yourself because you were that close to being set free. All thing you're going to do when you get up and leave is continue to do what you've always done. Hang in there. I'll preach a good three-point sermon somewhere down the line and hoop and holler and scream and do a cartwheel, but hang in here. <laughs> the Word is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the Word of faith, the faith Word or the spoken faith that we proclaim. The Word of faith or the one faith. It's God's faith. It's the faith of Jesus Christ. The faith of Jesus Christ in you speaks forth from your heart. The faith of Jesus Christ in you is going to speak from your heart. You already know what that faith says. It's the effortless language of Christ's faith. Now, we've been made, we've, we've made verse 9 about doing. Look at verse 9. Hang in there. We, we, we made verse 9 about doing. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, if thou shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, then thou shalt be saved. We made it about confessing and believing. We've made it about the prayer of salvation so that we can make heaven and miss hell. And yet, verse 6 and 7 specifically says, heaven and hell is not what faith speaks. So the mirror translation in verse 9 says this. <clears throat> Now your salvation, now your salvation is realized. Your own words echo God's voice. The unveiling of the masterful act of Jesus forms the words in your mouth inspired by the conviction in your heart that God indeed raised them from the dead. He is not saying, you got to say this to make it in your heart, but the day you received him, his faith came into you. You received his complete and total faith, and now that you got it in you, from that faith you speak, from that faith you confess, from that faith you say, I am saved. It has entered into me. I said yes to him in my seat in the back of the dome, and I am saved, and all of these marvelous works flow out there as my language. And faith deposited, faith deposited speaks. And what does faith deposited say? Finished. He says this in verse 9, now your salvation is realized. Your own words echo God's voice. The unveiling of your masterful acts of Jesus forms the words in your mouth, inspired by the conviction of your heart that God indeed raised him from the dead. So as our hearts believe, not through praying a prayer, but by having that aha moment, that yes moment, our language now will begin to echo his faith. It is finished. It is finished. My healing's finished. My victory is finished. My, 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 my addictions are finished. All right, now, I got two scriptures. Watch this. Two scriptures. Stay here. Stay here. Two scriptures. Mark eleven twenty two. Mark eleven twenty two, Jesus answered, saying unto them, Have faith in God. Mark eleven twenty two. We have we have, we 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 are to have God's faith because in the in the Greek here the word formed from from adding the personal pronoun, which I won't get into that. It brings it says you you have God's faith. Have the faith of God or have the God kind of faith. You see that in some other translations. 
The word echo is the present tense. We are to continually and habitually echo God's faith, or we are to echo what he, God, believes. In other words, echoing his faith is to be our lifestyle. The just shall live by echoing his faith. The just shall live not just by faith, but from it. From it. Faith is in me. I'm living from it. Glory to God. That faith that I'm already healed and I'm, I'm echoing, I'm already healed. That faith that I'm already delivered and I'm echoing, I'm already delivered. That faith that I'm already righteous and I'm echoing, I'm already righteous. All right, now watch this. Mark chapter 4 and verse 40. Wow, 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 wow. Ah, this is my last one, I think. <laughs> and he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Without going through all of the string of how your Greek translates that word have, that word have is translated echo. He says, in the middle of this storm, why are you so fearful? Think about the question. How are you going to ask me why am I fearful? Don't you see? And he says, I'm going to tell you how. My faith is in you. Why are you not echoing from the faith that's in you? S scared, why? You're carrying your rescue. You're carrying your deliverance. How come I'm not hearing what's in you? Why do I not hear the echo of what you carry? The finished is in me. And my voice should be echoing what my heart has. Mm. My heart has God's faith. My voice should be an echo of what's in me, Gloria. You ever been in a room where there's an echo? Glory to God. I am declaring right now that your life, your life is a room where the echo of the faith of God that lives on the inside of you is going to be heard. Every time you're under attack, you're going to echo victory. Every time your body gets sick, you're going to echo healing. Every time it seems like you're broke, you're going to echo provision. Every time the devil shows up, you're going to echo he's already been defeated no matter what's going on. Why is it that I don't hear the echo? Have or echo the faith of God. So if you say with your mouth what you have in your heart, if you will echo what you already have, I am echoing what I already have. And there will be a noticeable difference. You, you, you're talking about separation of the sheep and the goat. Those who get this, you're going to be like, whoa, 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 what is going on in my life? And those who say, oh, I don't believe that, and you get out 10 sheets of paper, and you just go, go at it because you don't believe it's done, and, and you're working to qualify for it, you're just going to be tired. like I realized I was. I was tired, tired of feeling like ain't none of them doing working. Tired of having to conjure up an anointing that didn't need it conjuring. 
to try to raise somebody from the dead who was where they, exactly they wanted to be. Tired of trying to convince God to do what he's already done. Tired of the competition in the pulpit to see who can say the greatest quote. Tired of being addicted to validation and worried about what folks think. Now, I just decided to move. To move out of religion into the realm of the finished. In him, we move. In him, we breathe. And in him, we have our very being. So now that I've moved, I can't force you to make any type of changes or adjustment, but I ain't never going back into the neighborhood of religion. And... And my life proves what I'm preaching. I wouldn't preach it until I could see it work. And boy, boy, does it work. You hear what I'm saying? So regardless of a person's present day situation, <laughs> I use myself as an example, I'm blowing my nose. Well, what happened to faith in you? I, you don't understand, I'm blowing my nose in the finished. <laughs> you, you see how you can't judge nobody? <laughs> Somebody presently done did something stupid and crazy, and they know it, and they love God, and they, they, they're not, not trying to do it again, but they, they, they believe their deliverance is in the finished. Yeah. And you know what? They're going to be delivered because they are delivered. Y'all didn't hear that. They're going to be because they are. This is how this works if you want a relationship with Jesus. Now, if you want a relationship with religion, you already know how that works. You've been doing a good job of it. <laughs> you want a relationship with the finish? You want to speak what it is finished speaks? Or you can speak according to the voice of Moses and continue to try to do what you think you need to do in order to get God to do something for you. It's time for you to be happy, and full of joy, and full of thanksgiving. <laughs> Having done all to do to stand, you just keep standing. And you stand, and you stand, and you stand knowing, watch this, this old song, that brighter days are ahead. <laughs> Why? Because you just live in the finish. And this is so different than religion piling on us all of the religious movement that has to take place in order for God to be able to do something for you. Mm -mm. Well, I tell you what, if you don't give your 10%, you're going to be cursed with a curse. That's just not the truth under this New Testament. Under the New Testament, he wants you to give a generous, out of your heart, offering, not to be scared. Because people did this. Well, you wouldn't have got no divorce if you were paying your tithe. That, Nick, that, that person just wanted your, uh... <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> Maybe that might be a sign I need to just go and leave that alone. Amen. <laughs> amen, amen. That might be a sign that this need to be over with for right now. <laughs> So did you get anything out of that this morning? <laughs> every eye closed, every head bowed. Let me explain to you what we're, we're doing now. So I believe that some of you have had an aha moment. Some of you have had a moment between you and the Holy Spirit in your heart. My altar call is not one to replace what has already happened in you. And by pure fact, you come down here, something has happened in you. But I just want to add affirmation 
to what the Holy Spirit, I believe, has already done. And whatever prayers we pray upstairs are just to affirm what happened before we prayed. But what happened before you came down to the line, I just want to rejoice with you and let you know that if that's something, that moment, that yes has already taken place or may be taking place right now, I'm saying say yes to him. I'm saying that deep down on the inside, you know what I'm saying is true, and you know all the stuff we've been doing, you knew that something was wrong with it all along. I'm grateful for all the things we learned in the past. We get to go from one step to another step to another step, and we wouldn't even, I would not even know this step had I not been in the other place. We esteem the law because without the law, we never saw our need for Jesus. So that's not to be critical of, everybody did what they did because that's what God told them to do at that time, to prepare us now for that next step and that next level. So if you've had that moment, you want affirmation of it, would you come down to this altar? If you're here today and you want to join the church, World Changes Church International. Somebody said, you, after that, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, even after that, because I believe that it's the spirit that brings you to the brook that you're supposed to be in. He said to Elijah, go to a certain brook, and there I'm going to sustain you. If you're fed up with the struggle of life, if you're fed up with the, the pain of religion, the bondage of religion, I offer you Jesus, the crescendo of everything that God has been saying and everything that I've tried to say.
Give it up for him. Hallelujah. I don't need a miracle to believe. I have his word. And that's enough. Amen. Father, thank you for those who've come down, moving their hearts as you already are. Make a mark in their lives that can never be erased. And for that, we give you praise. In Jesus' wonderful, mighty name, turn it around for them. We thank you. And everybody that agrees, say it, amen. amen. Don't you appreciate those who come down to this altar today? Yeah. Well, at this time, if you would turn and follow this gentleman to the prayer room, they're going to take you and minister to you and whatever else you need, answer questions, pray with you, love on you. And we believe the best is yet to come in your life. The best is yet to come. Thank you guys for coming to church today. If you would stand for our final blessing. And now may the spirit of grace escort you throughout this week. I declare divine protection over your life, over the life of your family members. I declare that you walk in such favor this week that it'll get the attention of somebody. I declare grace, grace over your life and that the peace of God will guide you all this week. I thank God for his divine care of you. And that seed that has been sown in the ground will show up as a mighty harvest. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Have a great day, everybody.